Well, good morning, church family. It is so good to be with you. And thank you for Ross and Mateo and Ollie for joining us on Zooming in with Pastor Dave. And I got my son here, Cole. He's going to ask some questions. And so what we're going to do is I got three questions I'm going to ask, more kind of serious questions. And then we're going to play this game called Drop the Ten with Ollie, my man. We are going to ask you ten questions and you have to answer them, okay? So here we go. Uh, what has been the best part of COVID? Well, it's not really the best part anymore, but like, um, like uh, I, I got to like no school. Yes. <laughs> that is. It, it's not the best part anymore because I want to see my friends. But now, yes. Ross, this one's for you. What has been maybe the hardest thing of COVID? Personally, it's been it's been difficult because I miss people, just kind of like everybody does, and then. I would say it's also hard because I just get my head into a space sometimes when I think about other people really hurting a lot and then there's even people in our own community, in our own church that may have already been um, yeah. either shut in or having difficulties or, or scared for their health or something like that. So, so I think my heart kind of, uh, has been continually just broken every time I think about it. If there's something that you want to say to the church family because they're watching here, is there anything that you want to say to the church family before we play Drop the Tent? I, I'm already going to be seeing a lot. Okay, so. well, we miss you all, and uh, looking forward to things getting normal again. Okay, we're going to play Drop the Ten with Ollie Cole. My son is going to ask you ten questions, Ollie, and you got to say the first thing that comes to your mind, okay? Are you up for it? I'm not ready for this. Ollie, what grade are you in? Uh, I'm in grade, currently, I'm in grade three, but I will be going into grade four. Uh, what's your favorite color? Blue. Blue? I know! Says Everyone that. says that! What's one thing you like about your parents? Uh... Uh... <laughs> did he just stop pinching my ear? <laughs> hey! We'll take it! What's your favorite class in school? Um... Oh, that's, that's a hard one. I like music, science, like gym. Gym. Is your bedroom clean right now? Uh... <laughs> can I go check? Do you think it's clean? Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are the names of each two? Molars, and then premolars. Canines, and then incisors. Good job. Hey, that's more than I would have known. So, Ollie, that's awesome. How fast can you run? How am I supposed to know that? What are some of the rules of chess? Don't pick your nose with the pieces. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's stop. Yeah, don't don't pick your nose with the pieces. What is the best scientific fact that you know? Always convinced that he can dye quartz to turn it into amethyst, and then he'll be able to sell it on the black market or something like that at exorbitant profits, and nobody will know the difference because it is technically just quartz. It just happens. And iron. All right, church family, is the the service is about to begin. So I get ready, and uh, God bless you. we'll see you. Um, next week. Well, good morning. I think we can do a little bit better than that for those that are in here this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And good morning to those who are tuning in online with us this morning. Thank you to the McLeods for that interview and for now knowing uh, what our teeth are called. Uh, if this is your first time here or you're just tuning in for the first time online, we want to say a special welcome to you. We would love to connect with you to get to know you and share with you more information about the ministries here at Emmanuel. There's an online connect card that we have uh, just for some basic information and then one of the pastors or staff will be, touch, will be in touch with you. Um, we're continuing on in our series this morning, Conversations with Jesus. Uh, Pastor Matt is going to be bringing the word and so we're really excited for that. Uh, just a couple quick announcements this morning. The first is that we have uh, another baby shower coming up, and it's a little bit different, obviously, because of our gathering restrictions. So it's a Zoom baby shower on, on July 23rd uh, for the foster parents, Sam and Zach Kennedy. Uh, they're expecting a child in August, and so this is really exciting for them. They're registered at myregistry.com, and you can email uh, office at emmanuelorelia.org to get the Zoom link for that to join. I would encourage uh, many of you to take part in that. Uh, secondly, 
Uh, with the current um, news of masks being required in indoor spaces, this is just a little bit of a brief update as to where we're at. So as of uh, next week, tomorrow, Monday, uh, when we come on Sunday mornings, it's going to be mandatory that all of us, staff, volunteers, and those attending, uh, wear masks. The exceptions are to those who uh, have medical reasons for doing so, and I know that this can be a bit of a point of contention, and so let's just assume that if, if someone isn't wearing a mask, that it's because of those medical reasons, uh, but we're all accountable to, to that as we enter into this space. Uh, for kids, um, the government's regulations are that anyone uh, under the age of five, there's some leading, leaning, leniency, leniency for, and, and so... Uh, they're encouraged to wear a mask. It is part of the expectation, but there's also an understanding, and we understand that as well. So uh, for children two and under, they're exempt from that. I know that my toddler it would probably be an impossibility to even get it on her face. So we, we do understand some of the challenges with this and just ask for, for your grace and patience as we try to follow the regulations that are in place. Uh, and, and at the same time, just want to thank the Lord that, that here we are even this morning, that we're able to gather in this space, uh, that we're able to center our hearts on his word, uh, that we're able to hear the word and to encourage one another by being together. And so uh, we're thankful for that. I know these are um, frustrating times for many. I know that there's a lot of things right now that we just want and we're longing for. And even just, you know, as we listen and, and meditate on the words of songs, I know many of our hearts are just longing to hear this place filled with voices singing praises to Jesus. And so our hearts are longing with you for those things. Uh, and we just ask for your continued patience as we try to navigate these times. Uh, now I'm going to invite you uh, to turn with me just in preparation before we uh, listen to this worship song by turning to, or I'm going to turn to Psalm chapter 4 and it's going to come on the screen uh, and I'm going to ask that you stand with me and we're going to read this psalm together. Uh, we're going to read the entirety of the psalm together this morning. Starting in verse 1. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, Make me dwell in safety. Amen. I'm just going to pray. Uh, you, can, you can be seated, and then we're going to listen to this, uh, these worship songs together. Our Father, this morning, we just uh, ask that you would center our hearts on who you are right now. And even as we have to uh, listen to these words, Lord, I pray that they would be reflections of praise in our hearts to you. Uh, God, we are thankful that we can be in this space, and we just ask, God, that you would draw us into your presence that you would speak to our hearts, uh, that we would honor and worship you in this place this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's sing out, church. Hallelujah, God above it all. Let's lift it up in this place and at home. Sing hallelujah, God. Love it all.
worship our King. Come, let's worship our King. Come, let's bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior's done. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Oh, He has done great things. pray together. Oh God, you have been faithful through every storm, and we know that you're going to be faithful forevermore, and that you have done great things, that you are doing great things. Uh, We know that you are an unchanging, perfect, holy God, who has made a way for, for people like us who are gathered here online and in this room, people like us who are broken because of the effects of sin in our own lives and in this world, but because of your faithfulness and your purposes, uh, we've been brought into relationship with you and are being made new. Uh, We're new creations in Jesus, and we're being made new, and we are your children. And this morning, Lord, we come to give you praise and honor and glory. Uh, We gather in the name of Jesus and want to exalt his name high as the name above every name. Uh, God, we thank you for your faithfulness in our lives and and just call out to you this morning, Lord, in in time of need. Lord, each of us do. Uh, Each of us needs you so desperately and and cry out with an earnest longing, Lord, fill our hearts. 
uh, expose any blind spots or areas of wandering. Uh, God, comfort us in affliction and in, and in anxieties, uh, in distress and difficulty, in uncertain times, in divisive times. Lord, in all of the chaos that we're experiencing, Lord, be our rock and our refuge. Be the one in whom we fix our eyes and hearts on. Keep us from the ways of the world, Lord. Align our hearts and wills with yours. Uh, Lord, may we delight in you that we would experience just the desires of our heart being filled by your presence. Because in your presence, there is fullness of joy. We know that. We've experienced and are experiencing that, Lord. And so uh, restore and renew us daily. Uh, Would we not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but transformed by the renewal of our mind? God, we commit ourselves to you this morning, asking that you would minister to our hearts, that you would speak to us. As Matt comes this morning, Lord, and opens your word, and we look at real conversations that Jesus had, God, we pray that those conversations uh, would have impact on our lives, that as we look to your holy and perfect and living word. God, this morning we uh, want to uphold others in our church family. Uh, We we first want to pray for our our leader, Dave and Chantel. Uh, God is there away on vacation. Lord, I pray that it would be restful for them. Uh, we, we thank you for the ways that you've used them to shepherd and care for so many of us. And Lord, just pray that this would be a time of, of rest and renewal for them. Uh, God, we pray uh, for this upcoming week and the, week, the next couple of weeks with our kids uh, that are doing the day camp in a box. Uh, Lord, as the gospel reaches homes through a different means and, and neighbors are coming to participate in these uh, camp programs, God, I pray uh, that you would use this. Uh, We know that you use uh, so many different things, and so now we're praying that you would use day camp in a box to reach children with the good news of Jesus Christ, that it would be a way for them to have fun and connect with one another, but above all, Lord, uh, that Jesus would be seen for who he is through the stories and the gospel presentation uh, in these boxes. Uh, God, I pray for parents and those leading through these camps, that you would help them. I know that this is a tricky time for parents, and and just pray, God, your blessing and grace on them as they seek to continue to care for and lead their children through this time. God, we want to just give the the rest of this service to you. Uh, We are yours and are expecting to hear from you this morning. Uh, We love you and thank you so much that we can be gathered together. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Luke 24, verses 13 to 18. And that very day, two of them were going to a village named Damascus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened there. While they were talking and discussing with each other, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Then he asked them, What is this conversation you were holding with each other as you walk? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? Well, good morning, church, and today we are continuing on in our Conversations with Jesus series, uh, a series like Josh said that, that really looks at conversations that Jesus had with people along the way as he lived his life and walked with others. And, and today we're going to be looking at uh, really seeing God, seeing our lives uh, past the disappointment and doubt that often creeps in. Uh, Sometimes it doesn't just creep in, but sometimes it it affronts us as we go to live our lives. And uh, I just want to start off by telling you a story of of, uh, my wife and I's trip to uh, Switzerland. Uh, We got married uh, around this time last year, and uh, within a couple weeks we were on a plane flying across the ocean for the first time I think I ever did that. And uh, we found out that there is this mountain called Jungfraue, and uh, apparently it's like the tallest one of all of Europe, and so we got really excited. We wanted to go and see this mountain. We wanted to get on top of it and just see uh, the the vast panoramic expanse of the Swiss Alps. And once we got up there, it became very clear that we weren't going to see that. There was just like this thick, cloud of, of mist and fog. And uh, we, we still had a good time up there. We were walking around. Uh, we found a bird. We took a picture of the bird. Uh, but the picture of the bird was not the picture of the panorama 
that we thought we were going to get, you know? And, and very clearly, uh, it, it, it became obvious that our disappointment was not, not that we were somewhere we didn't want to be, right? This happens to us in life. We, we, we get to a spot that we wanted to be, that we thought was going to be fantastic, that we thought was going to be beautiful and, and meaningful and fulfilling, but once we got there, there was almost this fog that stopped us from experiencing what we had hoped for. And if, if we're honest, often our, our walk with Jesus can be like this too, right? We, we dedicate our, our Sunday mornings to coming even among COVID restrictions and, and we're anticipating this, this amazing thing. And you know, sometimes God meets us and sometimes it feels like he doesn't. There's something that gets between us and experiencing him in, in the reality of who he is. It's not that the expanse wasn't beautiful. It's not that the panorama wasn't there. It's just that there was something between us. Something that kept us from seeing what we desired to see. And maybe uh, as, as I'm saying this, you can think of disappointments in your life that currently are weighing on your shoulders. Uh, perhaps you thought that in July of 2020, you were going to be in a very different place than you are right now. Uh, I, I pastor some students, and I know that right now they have this, uh, this disappointment hanging over their head where, where they thought that they were going to go to this university in the fall. But it looks like they're probably just going to be doing university at home online, you know? They're not going to be able to escape their parents like they thought they were. But I'm sure all of us have disappointments. And a lot of us have doubts. Doubts about who Jesus is. Doubts about whether God cares. And this morning we're going to be looking at a conversation in Luke chapter 24. If you want, you can turn there with me. Luke chapter 30, uh, 24, starting in verse 13. And we're going to see that Jesus comes alongside these, these two disciples who are caught in disappointment. They had hoped for something that didn't get realized. Uh, they are currently doubting. They're doubting, their, they, they're doubting whether they ever should have started following Jesus. And they're on their way home. They've left Jerusalem, they've left where Jesus was crucified, and they're on their way home. They're packing it in and going back, but Jesus has a conversation with them that I believe offers us hope. And so as we're turning there, uh, let's just bow in prayer as we ask the question, how can we see through the fog of disappointment and doubt? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning that you have come with your word. Uh, Lord, that as we're going to see this morning, that you speak so powerfully and so clearly through your word and, and meet us as we are where we are. Uh, Lord, that you do not require us uh, to build up some intellectual faith that uh, knows you and is, is so confident um, but even in the time of doubt and in the time of disappointment, that you would come and show yourself to us, reveal yourself, and, and bolster our faith in you. And Lord, just like these disciples uh, that had false expectations, false hopes, hopes and expectations that were lower than what you were actually doing in their lives, Lord. We pray that you would uh, just raise our hopes and raise our expectations of who you are and what you're doing in this world. Uh, Lord, we pray that as these disciples gain a greater vision of who Jesus Christ is, that our vision this morning would be enhanced. Uh, that Christ and Christ alone would be magnified in our eyes. That we wouldn't be longing after worldly things. That we wouldn't be like those disciples who pack up and walk home. But God, that our eyes would be fixed on you and you alone. And that our love for you, our desire for you, our passion for you and for your name would increase this morning. And Lord, we thank you for your spirit that is with us today doing that. Working in our lives, moving us towards yourself. And so, Lord, we pray, have your way as we hear from your word this morning. Amen. 
Uh, So we're going to be starting in verse 13, and and what we're going to see right off the bat is that Jesus draws near, Jesus draws near to the downcast. Uh, This is really an amazing thing because a a lot of the times in in our hearts and in our minds we think, you know, when, when I'm doubting, certainly God is not with me. Certainly when I'm doubting, God God is, you know, affronted by me and, and disappointed in me. When, when I'm disappointed in him, surely uh, I'm far from him. And yet what we see is that when we are far from God, he is closer to us still. That he does not leave us in our, our downcast, in our doubt, in our disappointment. Let's read together in verse 13. Uh, This is following the resurrection of Jesus, and yet you're going to see that these disciples have not come to know that Jesus has been resurrected. Let's read together. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were walking with each other about, uh, they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Uh, this, is, this is so emphatic that it says Jesus himself drew near and went with him. This isn't uh, some disembodied spirit that meets with them. This isn't uh, somebody that Jesus sends or, or an angel that comes and walks with them. But this is Jesus himself bodily resurrected from the dead, walking with them. And we'll see why that's so important, but truly, this is a revelation of Jesus to them. He draws near and goes along with them. Here we could stop and we could just reflect on the fact that Jesus draws near to the downcast, to the brokenhearted, that Jesus comes alongside and goes with Jesus doesn't say, here I am, come to me. He he goes along with those who are plagued by doubt and disappointment. But let's continue on in verse 16. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And they said to him, what is this, or he said to them, what is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, named Clopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women in our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of us, some of those who were with us, went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Here we see this conversation that they're having with Jesus. You know, Jesus asked them, oh, what are you guys talking about as they're walking along? They said, are, are you the only one who doesn't know what's been happening? Are you the only one who doesn't know about Jesus, who, who lived this life? He was a prophet, but he was condemned. He was crucified and buried. Are you the only one who doesn't know this? Uh, this is kind of interesting, just for the sake of noting this, that Jesus' death was well known in Jerusalem. That this was a thing that the city was bustling about. So that when people started going around saying that that Jesus who died on that cross was raised from the dead, people weren't left scratching their head like, oh, who's Jesus? It's like Jesus was well known. And and so when they came and said that this Jesus, are you the only one who doesn't know? It just shows that that our faith is, is centered on one who was well known. He wasn't just one of many, but he was the one. 
Uh, it's ironic too, isn't it, that Jesus is truly the only one who knows what's actually going on in this conversation. Uh, Jesus comes to them and says, you know, what's going on? And they say, are you the only one who doesn't know? This is true in our lives too, right? In those darkest days when we're on our knees in prayer and we're saying, God, do you not know? Do you not know what's happening to me? Do you not know what's happening to my family? Do you not know what's happening in my life right now? Lord, do you not know? This is such great encouragement to us because he is the only one who knows. He's the only one in those deepest moments of suffering and grief, in those times of loss and doubt and disappointment, who truly knows. And we have a Savior who not only knows intellectually, but knows because he died on the cross for our sins. That he endured the greatest suffering that there is. He endured the greatest disappointment in, in humanity who waged war against the living God of the universe. He knows our pain. He knows beyond our pain. Do you not know? But if you notice in 21, in verse 21, if you look there with me, another statement of irony, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Here we see this expectation, right? If you remember, they, they note that Jesus is a prophet, that Jesus is one who, who taught amazing things. And, and they had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel, that, that he would be like this force in the world for the God of the universe who would be pushing back political powers, making way, uh, you know, bringing Israel out from underneath the boot of Rome. And yet they were disappointed. Their, their Savior was crucified and died. We had hope that he was the one to redeem Israel. And again, in our lives, we are like this. We, we have these hopes and desires for our lives, these expectations. And when we are disappointed, we go to God and we say, Lord, do you not know how disappointed I am? I, I had hoped that you would do this. I had hoped that I would be here by 25. I had, I had hoped that I would be retired by this age. I had hoped that this friend I've been praying for would come to faith. But our hopes, our expectations are not high enough. We look at God and we say, surely you can do these small things. Surely you can do these little things in my life because you are the God of the universe. You are strong to do these things. You are strong to make political advances in Israel against Rome. But God is doing something greater. Our hopes and our expectations are not high enough. And still, even though Jesus is drawing near to them, they are left not seeing him. They still cannot see the God who stands before them. Uh, this, this quote by Catherine, uh, I'm going to say this bad, I'm not going to say this right. Anybody know German? I apologize. Uh, Sonderegger, Catherine Sonderegger, she writes a, a theology book that kind of reads really, really nicely if you're a reader and you're like, mm, I don't know about theology, sounds too intense for me. Uh, she does a very good job. But uh, I'm going to read this quote, and, and I think it really unveils to us how God can stand before us and we cannot see him. She writes this, The hiddenness of God, his secrecy and mystery, emerges not from absence, but rather from divine presence. You know, these disciples walking with Jesus, Jesus doesn't appear out of nowhere. He doesn't appear out of absence. But he's already with them. He emerges from presence. We continue on in that quote, as he is in creation, in his own sovereign being, his aseity, he can be the invisible one. Just this affirmation of one Lord's commanding presence in the midst of his mystery and hiddenness is knit into the very structure of biblical revelation. Now you might be like, all right, Matt, you said that it was going to be super readable. I don't even know what you just said. So let's backtrack. What she's saying, I think, is so helpful for us. 
and shows us why these disciples can be walking along the road with Jesus and not recognize him, but also has something to say about us when we are in these difficult moments and we're like, God, where are you? You are absent from my life right now. The reality is, is that God is something like the air around us. That he is present everywhere. And because he is present everywhere, you and I all too often, like the air, we just forget about it. We're not attending to the fact that God is here with us right now. Can you imagine what it would be like if you walked around 24-7 just experiencing in the fullness of God's presence your life? In some ways it would be immensely freeing, but in another it would be immensely crushing to recognize that I, a sinful person, am before the living God 24 hours a day. And this presence of God that is always with us often is experienced in the mystery and hiddenness of God. No wonder the person who does not believe can say, I don't see God. Where at the same time, the believer can say, I see God everywhere. Because he is in all places, we often overlook him. So how can we see past that then? If we are in these moments of disappointment and doubt like these disciples are, how can we see past that? How can we see through the hiddenness of God to his presence? Let's continue on in verse 25. And here we're going to see that Jesus turns the disciples to the word of God. Jesus lifts our eyes to the word. He shows us himself in scripture. Let's read in verse 25. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe, all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, wasn't it? When I was younger, I would be working with my brother uh, outside of the house or in the barn or something, and we would be doing something far too complex for me to comprehend, all right? A little beyond me. So I would kind of be the guy who would, like, collect the wrenches and give them to him, and he's, he's, like, fixing the car or something. And all too often, I had a flashlight in my hand, basically just being, you know, the stand-in for the sun when it went down. I was pretty useless. And more often than not, this resounding phrase would just rhyme off in my head. I don't even know if he said it or if it was just like through trauma impacted on my brain. Pay attention. Pay attention. Pay attention. Matt, pay attention. What am I doing? Where's the light? Pay attention. And maybe this phrase is common to you. Maybe you are one of those people who say pay attention. Or maybe you are like me, uh, a frequent hearer of the phrase. This is kind of like what Jesus is saying, right? Oh, you foolish ones, have you, not, have you not seen that the Messiah is not one who's going to come and, and reign because he amasses great crowds? He's not some ruler who's with political force going to topple down the government. Oh, you foolish ones, pay attention. Read your Bible. If we flip back to Moses, he starts in Moses. And I mean, you only have to get to chapter 3 to be like, oh, yeah. Messiah is going to suffer. In Genesis 3.15, we, we see something called the Proto-Evangelion. I don't know Latin, but we're going to say it anyways. Verse 15, God is cursing the, the man and the woman and the snake uh, for their sin. He says to the woman, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You shall bruise, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So he says to the snake, sorry, I said that totally wrong. He says to the snake that, you know, generations of Eve will be born. And one day there will be one who you're going to strike his heel. You know, you're going to nip at him, but he's going to crush your head. 
And all throughout Genesis, you see that, that it's like you're on the seat, you're on the edge of your seat waiting for the one who evil is going to strike, but he's going to crush the head of the serpent. And at the end of Genesis, we get that phrase, you know, Joseph turns to his brothers and says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. That what nipped at my ankle, God meant for good and crushed evil through it. Through evil, God conquers evil. Now, by the time we get to Jesus, we see that this is true in a way that we never expected. But we should have expected that the seed of the woman goes all the way to the person of Jesus Christ. His ankle is certainly bit by the snake. Satan thinks he has the victory, but Jesus crushes the head of the snake. He defeats Satan and evil and death once and for all. This is a very common passage that, that we read around uh, Christmas. But now let's move to the prophets. And in Isaiah 53, we, we all know this. It says that he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. What was meant for evil turned out to be our good. Jesus turns to his disciples who are walking away from Jerusalem, going back home, because of their disappointment, they doubt Jesus the prophet. But Jesus reveals to them Jesus the Messiah. Their hope is too low and Jesus raises their expectation by saying, this is bigger than you ever could have imagined. And Jesus reveals himself in the scripture. Now I think this is really important for us because when we feel distant, when we feel like there is a fog between us, Jesus is inviting us to go to his word, right? Right? Jesus is inviting us to go to his word, to go through the Old Testament and read it like Christian scripture. To go through the Old Testament and read it as though it is about the person of Jesus Christ who will come and die and be resurrected and bring new life to his people. But we are also invited to read the Old Testament as though it's pointing to Jesus. Just like Jesus interprets the Old Testament, the Old Testament tells us about who Jesus is. Jesus lifts our eyes to his word, and by reading his word, our eyes are lifted up. But they still don't quite see. If we read on, we, we actually see that these disciples, uh, their eyes are yet to be opened. Scripture uh, points them in the right direction, but if we read in verse 28, we're going to see that Jesus then reveals himself in community. And I think that this is very important for us today, especially as, as many of us are at home right now um, because of the difficulties of our world. But today, Jesus is going to highlight to us the importance of community. So let's read together in verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as though he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. Now here we see this decisive moment, where it's like, you know, in, in our lives, we are walking with Jesus in these moments of doubt and disappointment as he draws near to us, there's a decisive moment where we can either enter into community in some ways to open our, our hearts to Jesus or to just split ways. These disciples were, were left with a decision to make on that road to say, you know what, great talking to you, great hearing about the word, great hearing about, you know, your idea of who Jesus is. Um, we're just going to stay in Emmaus. We're going to figure out our lives from here on out, and uh, best of luck to you, fellow voyager. But they don't. 
They make room for him. They invite him in to do more. And you and I have the same opportunity often, right? In our journey, we have this decisive moment where we've heard the truth of who Jesus is, and and we have that moment of decision where we either say, yes, come into my home, come into my space, gather with me and others, and an impact. Or we can say, you know what, that's fine, but I'm just going to keep on going. I'm not going to see past my present circumstance. Jesus reveals himself in community. Let's continue on in verse 30. When he was at the table with him, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Surely this line that he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them, would jog their memory back to the feeding of the 5,000. In Luke 9, uh, we read this. There's 5,000 people, and Jesus says to his disciples, have them sit down in groups, about 50 each, and they did so, and had them sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he took Uh, He looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And I love this. I love this so much because what what Jesus is doing here is, is welcoming them to think back on previous experiences of Jesus. To think back on what God has done in the past and then look forward to their present circumstance and beyond and think, you know, I I have a future. The thing that Jesus did for me back then, he can do now. But it also pushes us to think of where this happens today. Uh, Jesus physically existing with us is through his body, the church. That Jesus reveals himself in community, and that community is the gathered body of believers. Now, I don't know about you, but in really difficult times I've had, whether, whether it's relational trouble or trouble even with the church, in my heart, my, my innate response is to shrink back from community, to be alone, to withdraw myself from the people around me who care for me because they certainly don't understand what I'm going through, Right? They certainly don't know how to take me from where I am to where I need to be. And many of us do this. Many of us distance ourselves from community because it's dangerous to enter into community. But that's where Jesus makes himself known. That's where Jesus breaks bread and gives it to us. That's where we remember what Jesus has done for us and we encourage one another with that. Now in verse 31, we see that their eyes are finally opened. They gather in community, they break bread together, they see. But then Jesus vanishes. It's almost like this whole story where we're waiting for Jesus to reveal himself and once he's revealed, he's gone. Where is he? Now I say this because this whole time we've been looking for their eyes to be opened, but we're going to see that what we were really waiting for this whole time was for their hearts to be opened. Uh, they, They talk about their hearts early on in the passage. Uh, Jesus says that they are foolish and slow of heart to believe. That this isn't a mind problem, this isn't a sight problem, this isn't a sensory problem, you know, I need to feel Jesus, but this is a heart problem. That their hearts have yet to see him. And in this moment, when they finally see him with their eyes, this is their response. We're going to see in verse 32. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while we talked? Or while he talked to us on the road and opened to us the scriptures. Uh, Blaise Pascal, a mathematician, polymath, theologian, fantastic fellow, French if you're into that. He says this, 
The heart has its reasons for which reason does not know. We feel it in a thousand things. It is the heart which experiences God and not the reason. This then is faith. God felt by the heart, not by the reason. Now you could be reading this and you could be like, that's a dramatic overstatement. Uh, We need to cognitively believe things about God. It's very important to Christianity that we believe in things like the Trinity and the Incarnation and the death of Jesus and his resurrection. Uh, There are things that we need to cognitively believe and yet we believe that the faith of a child who has a heart turned towards God, who experiences God, is legitimate faith. And here these disciples, their doubts and disappointments were so attached to their, their expectations in here of who Jesus would be and not their heart of who Jesus would be. They have an unfeeling heart as they walk along with him. But their heart changes and look at the result. In verse 33 it says, And they rose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed such a resounding change from what they had said previous. We did not see him. Now the Lord has risen indeed. And has appeared to Simon and they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. We see the witnesses of Jesus, those who see him, what do they do? They witness. People who have been illuminated to who God is, to what Jesus has done, they go and and like shining lights show people who Jesus is and what he's done. Uh, If if faith is a heart thing, if if it's not just, um, God is not just a feeling, but if faith is an experience of God, if the heart has reasons the head has no understanding of, then we see people who go into places and share Jesus as though they had nothing to lose. Without a thought, what flows out of their heart to another's heart. So I want to just point us to four things here as we close. And the first is, is really, all of these are just an offer. As we come to Jesus with our disappointment and our doubts, I want to ask you this. Did you sense Jesus' nearness this morning? Do you sense Jesus' nearness now? Do you recognize that he is not absent, and I'm not asking in your mind, That you cognitively believe that he's everywhere. But do you sense his nearness to your heart? That he cares for you? Do you see Jesus in his word? Maybe this morning, even as we just read, or as as Brittany read, has your heart sensed sight through scripture? Did God reveal himself to you in his word? Third thing, do you long to be with his church? Do you long to be with his body? Those gathered representing Jesus physically. And fourth, does your life reflect that? Does what you do in your life reflect to the world, witness to the world that you love Jesus, that Jesus has your heart, That your love is for him and for him alone. That you have this wild passion for him and for his name. And I want to say, until we have that passion, maybe we are like these disciples. Unless we can say that we have this longing to be with this church, unless we can say that we have seen Jesus in his word, unless we can say that we sense Jesus' nearness, Might I suggest that our hearts are not yet his? And maybe you this morning 
are sensing this decisive moment like those disciples where you're sitting in these chairs or maybe you're sitting at home and, and this is the moment where you can say either I'm going to part ways with him or I'm going to welcome him close. And in that welcoming, uh, we enter into new life. Our eyes are enlightened and we see who he is And we, like those disciples, are changed. Their hope that turned into disappointment became hope that they never had. Their expectation of what God was doing in their world that was lost was found in ways that they could have never thought but they could only sense through their heart. That God was doing something in our world that no one could expect. That couldn't be walked away from. And they beelined it back to Jerusalem to tell everybody. May God do the same in our hearts this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for what you have done this morning. Uh, As we've come to your word and we trusted, Lord, that you would meet us, even in just hearing the words that you have given to us, God, we have heard from you. We have sensed that even in the midst of our disappointment and doubt that you have drawn near to us. Uh, that you have lifted up our eyes from low expectations to higher expectations through your word. And that God, because we are gathered in community like this, uh, that we in one another, even this morning, have experienced you. Lord, our prayer is that we witnesses of your goodness this morning would become witnesses to our world of your goodness. Father, there is nothing better than following you. We thank you for giving your son. And we pray that by your Holy Spirit that our lives might be marked by a profound love for you, Lord. And that our lives would look different because of that. We pray these things in your name. Amen. And uh, we're just going to watch some uh, worship videos again. I know it's bizarre. Uh, But take this time to just prayerfully reflect on uh, maybe some of those things that God has been tugging at your heart this morning. Let's do that together.
stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop. You never stop, no.
uh, from whatever circumstance we're entering into a fellowship together this morning, uh, whether you are downcast, whether uh, you have been met by disappointment as of late or doubt, uh, my prayer is that God's word has encouraged you, that you have felt as though God has drawn near to you this morning, uh, that he's shown you from his word that not only does he care for you, but uh, that his son is truly the one who saves us in these moments uh, from sin, Satan, and death, and that he's given to us a community of people around us who can encourage us, uh, who can be like Christ to us, to ensure us of his love and care for us, but then sends us out into the world that if we truly have seen him, if we have witnessed who he is, that we will then reflect him to this hurting world. And so I encourage you to do that now. Uh, as we close, uh, go and be, as Jesus says, lights of the world. Amen.